screen. All right, so let's, let's share the screen here. So, Pastor Razan, can you make it to for sending the screen? Yeah, 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 yeah. I already did it. Already did okay. it. Yep. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and begin with prayer, men. Um, and we'll start with our class here. So, Father, thank you for the opportunities we have to serve you in various places of the world. Thank you for opportunities to give out the glorious gospel. Thank you for the pre the precious uh, opportunity to study your word. Pray, Lord, you continue to help our technology to hold up so we can be able to understand and, and communicate your word clearly. Help us understand the book of James, Father, as we... First of all, live out these tests, but also, Lord, then as we uh, teach others about the tests of life and tests of our faith. So, Lord, bless our time together today. Uh, keep my voice strong and help us all, Lord, to have hearts that are both hear for academic reasons, but also, Lord, hearts that hear for spiritual reasons so we can grow more like Christ and we can pass these tests. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, men, welcome back. We will continue with our study through the book of James. Um, I anticipate after today, we will have two more classes, one for uh, to finish the book and then one for a final exam. So just to let you know what, what my plans are. So Lord willing, today we will make it through uh, test number nine and 10. And then we'll look at the last two tests next week. Uh, at the at the middle of class, uh, at the beginning of the next hour, we will have our quiz. But one thing I did ask you to do is to <clears throat> send in to uh, Dr. Victor uh, what you believe are the four last tests that were found in James 5. So the tests of our faith. So we looked through all these different tests of our faith from James chapter 1, the first 17 verses really are explaining what tests of our faith are for and how they prove us and, and show us the strength and the health of our faith, even with the encouragement that we can ask for wisdom in verse 5 of chapter 1, we'll be rewarded and blessed in, in verse 12 of chapter 1. But then uh, around verse 18 of chapter 1, we begin learning these different tests, our relationship to God's word. You know, and how genuine our faith is, that's the end of, uh, or our religion is, that's the end of chapter one. And chapter two goes into uh, how we treat others, how we are treating others, um, the rich and the poor and so forth, as James 2 refers to. And then how healthy is our faith, is our faith uh, shown forth by works. Chapter three moves into another faith dealing with our tongues. And whether we control our tongues for the glory of God or whether our tongues are out of control. And then the end of chapter three deals with practical wisdom and whether we have practical wisdom or just worldly wisdom. So moving to chapter four, we learned about the test of our faith dealing with uh, the ideas of who do we seek to please? Are we just naturally pleasing ourselves, which is our natural bent? We don't even have to try to do that. It just happens normally and naturally. Or are we trying to please the world? Or, of course, the right choice is the healthy faith seeks to please God. The end of chapter 4 deals with the will of God. And our relationship to the will of God, is that something that we seek to do? And is that something that's always forefront that we're saying the Lord willing will do it? Or is it something we plan? And if it's God's will, it works out. If it's not, you know, uh, if it were, whatever happens is going to be God's will, a fatalistic position. Or is it that we really believe God has a plan for us? And we really seek it. And that's the end of chapter four. So then we move to chapter five. And chapter five has the last four of these tests. And uh, so I ask you to submit to, to Victor at least your, your thoughts about that. What, what do you think the last four are? It's not really a necessarily right or wrong uh, answer um, for the most part, just as long as you're reading through it. And, and trying to figure it out yourself, because what I'm trying to do in this class is not just give you information, but my class, as Dr. Victor and I planned out this class, was then the, is to kind of teach you the idea of studying a book, a book study, where we study a whole unit of scripture given to us by God's spirit, by one author uh, given, given to us. And of course, we have 66 books of the Bible that are like that. 
27 books in the New Testament, but given to us as units with a theme. And oftentimes, uh, almost every book, obviously every book, New Testament especially, an outline that follows. And what's that God-intended uh, theme and outline of the book? And so we chose the book. Of, uh, it's been very difficult. It is, it is a book that's, uh, that is teachable in one semester. Instead of going to another one of the books, it might be a two or three semester course. So here's one semester course. In one semester, we're covering the very quickly, covering James, the book of James. We have one theme, um, which I believe is a test of our faith. And then the outline throughout the book are the 12 different tests after he explains uh, the introduction. So the last four, you need to submit to Dr. Uh, Victor. If you have not, uh, you need to do that now. Uh, at the latest, you can do it is at the middle, at the break time, because we have the quiz we're going to take over this class is over this uh, this week is going to be after the break. Um, so we're ready to get into the class then. Uh, test number nine, I guess it works out to be, you react when treated with injustice. And I believe that's the next test we're studying here. So let me get this, get my things all lined up and ready to go. So how do we how do we react when treated with injustice? That's an, a ninth test of our faith. How we react is uh, it shows how strong or how healthy our faith is. We will all be treated with injustice to one degree or another. Uh, that's just part of the human experience, sadly. And there's always someone who's who's an unsaved person, unfortunately, even a few times believers, who uh, who will treat us unjustly because we're Christians or because they are richer than we are or they are more powerful than we are for whatever reason it is. Uh, we, in your country, because they're different caste systems or from different parts of the world or different parts of India, uh, they will treat people will treat other people unjustly. I've seen that. Uh, I've seen that um, in your country. I've seen that in my country. It's unfortunately part of sinful man's character or nature. And so here, James, by inspiration of God's Spirit, is dealing with this as the test of our faith. How we how we react when we are treated with injustice says a lot about our faith in the Lord and the health of our faith. And so beginning with um, the first six verses here, we have the illustration of being treated with injustice, where it says, Go to now, ye riches that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and treasure together for the last days. Verse 4. Behold, the hire the laborers who have reaped down your fields. Which of you kept back by fraud? Which is of you kept back by fraud? Crieth. So the higher the laborers crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped and entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath, the Sabbath. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wadden. Ye have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. Verse 6, ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. To begin with, here in verses 1 through 6, he gives us an illustration. This is not the only type of injustice we find in the world. I gave you a couple of examples, like being from different parts of the world, being from different parts of India. Uh, when I'm over in, when I'm over in um, what would it be for you, southeastern India, uh, southeastern Asia, where I've spent a lot of my ministry over the past uh, 15 years, a lot of prejudice. Uh, a lot of injustice there between different different um, people groups, different countries, and so forth. Uh, but it's, I've seen it in India as well, people people treating different ones. If you're from the south, then people from the northeast are treated differently. And if you're from the north, you treat people from the south differently. And it's all, it goes on. I've seen this. Um, you know, Christ, when we're saved, should change that. Uh, of course, in our hearts, in our minds, uh, but sometimes that, that ingrained culture in which you're brought up with is, is still a struggle. We have a, a similar situation here in the States. So injustice is all across the world. Uh, unsaved man treats others unjustly all the time. The question is, the faith is our faith, and how do we react when we are treated unjustly? In our illustration, verses 1 to 6, it deals with rich and poor. It deals with those, say, let's say wealthy uh, homeowners or wealthy um, farmers who then hire day, hire, or hires people to come and to work for them for a day. People who are, in our country, we call them day laborers. They work for the day to get paid for the day. 
And and so, and I know you have some of those in India as well. I've, I've met some, I've talked to some people who are like that. So this is the illustration that is applicable to India, but it doesn't have to be just this illustration. It's any area in which a person is mistreated or treated unjustly by someone else. So here's the illustration. Let's go ahead and look at it a little more in detail what it talks about and realize that it begins with um, talking about the selfish rich man or selfish rich men, verse one. That's in this illustration, that's who especially is brought out. And that's probably the most common situation where selfish rich people mistreat those who are dependent upon them, those who are less fortunate than they are. First Timothy chapter six <clears throat> talks about this a little bit, talks about the selfish, uh, talks about the rich man, I should say, and gives some challenges for the rich man. I, I think it's good for us to pause. Because what I want you to understand is nowhere does the Bible condemn a person for being simply being rich. Because God is the source of the riches. And so God doesn't simply uh, condemn a person for being rich. If so, even if someone becomes rich, an unsafe person becomes rich, it's because of God-given ability and talent that has allowed them to do that, whether they realize it or not. God does not condemn a person for being rich, but God judges us by our, our use of resources. Now, what's that, that's important, especially because sometimes even the church, I've seen that the average Christian looks at a rich Christian with um, anger, uh, suspicion, um, distrust, or sometimes the other way around, they look at him as, as someone who owes them something, which may or may not be the case. And so <clears throat> if, if you have in the church family, and some churches in India, I've met some very rich uh, Indian Christians. Um, there are some rich people that God has blessed with resources, especially I've met them in the cities. Well, the, the rich person needs to realize, as First Timothy 6 says, that God is the one that's blessed them and given them those resources, and it's not just for their own pleasure or for their own enjoyment. So let's look at a few verses dealing with this. First Timothy chapter six. It's good to understand this because, so, like I said once again, sometimes we get the idea that having money is sinful and it's wrong. And sometimes, especially if you're in an area that's influenced by certain false religions. Uh, you you get the idea that a rich person should uh, sell all they have and give to the poor. That's not necessarily what the Bible teaches. There are certain situations where that may be true, but that's not a command to the rich. First Timothy six seventeen says, "Charge them that are rich in this world." It's Paul giving the instruction to Timothy, who is pastoring the church of Ephesus, which is probably a rich church, probably similar to some of the churches maybe. Some good Bible preaching churches, maybe in Delhi or in Mumbai or uh, some of the other business centers of the world uh, of India, where you may have some rich people. Charge them their rich in this world, that they be not high minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. So, first it says, challenge the Christians who are blessed with wealth, blessed with resources. Blessed with riches, maybe blessed with land, whatever the whatever their source of their riches are, maybe they're just successful business or whatever else. Charge them not to be high minded or to trust in those riches, because riches can come and go. Uh, when a business can go out of business, and, and a very wealthy businessman who owns a business could become very poor overnight because his business could go bankrupt or his business could lose all its all its value or whatever else. Some of that happened during COVID, for instance. Uh, but the trust not in the uncertain riches, verse 17 says, but the trust in the living God who gives us these riches to enjoy. So it even brings out the aspect that if God blesses you, there's, a, there's an aspect where it doesn't mean you have to sell it all, but there's some of it he gives you to enjoy and to use. Verse 18 then goes on to say that they do, that here's how, specifically how you use it as a Christian. You use your resources to do good to be rich in good works, to be ready to distribute, to share, willing to communicate, 
So you see other Christians who have needs, and as God has blessed you, then you look for ways to meet their needs, sometimes anonymously. That doesn't mean that others need to know who you are that's helping, but you are helping other Christians who are going through some difficult times. God has blessed you financially, not just for your own enjoyment, but for you to be a blessing to others in the church and other Christians. Because 19 says you're actually laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. They're not just investing in their business. They're not just investing in the stock market. But if they are Christians and they're giving toward other believers or following the Lord's direction and investing in doing good or maybe in helping them to, to, um, to fund or build a, um, uh, a church building or perhaps to help with a Christian ministry, help with a Christian college or a Christian school, They'll use your resources like that. You are not just investing for this world. You're investing for eternity. You're investing in the, it says in verse 19, that the time to come. You're investing for eternity. And I can promise you that God pays a lot better return on our, our money than the world does. <clears throat> so nowhere does the Bible condemn a person for being rich, but God does judge us according to how we use the riches he gives us. Sometimes he gives us more if we use it faithfully. Sometimes he takes it all away if we're not faithful. The second teaching of scripture about riches is that money is a stewardship, a responsibility from God. And that's just a reminder also from Old and New Testament. This time we're going to Old Testament. We're reminded that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You know, God, and all, all the, any money a rich person has, is from God. He has blessed their talents. He has blessed their opportunities. He has blessed them with promotion. He has blessed them with intellect to be able to, to go to college and study, go to university and college and study these things. God is God is the source of those abilities, you know, uh, to be able to make that successful, to be successful in in medicine, or be successful in business, or be successful in whatever field that is. God has blessed that person to do that. It's a stewardship. It's a responsibility. And it's not just for us to enjoy, but for us to use it for God's glory. But that's reminded, reminded of that as well. And then money is not to be our priority. <clears throat> Nothing wrong with having money, but when we be begin to make it our priority, or as Paul says there in 1 Timothy 6, to trust in uncertain riches, make it our priority. Jesus says you cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. You have to choose which one to serve. And so um, warnings are there in the scripture about money and riches. So that's there. So remember that. This, talking about the selfish rich men here as the illustration, but it's not a across-the-board condemnation of all rich people, especially not Christians who have been blessed financially. They use that as a resource and a blessing to the church and to the believers. So I want to give you a little, that's just a little theology of, of riches, a little theology on money. Uh, we find in, 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 in the scripture here, God does not condemn people for being simply for being rich. It's not a sin to be rich, but we are held accountable for how we use this riches in money and riches and resources and land and property and opportunity are all stewardships from God. We are responsible to God for that. And money is never to be something we trust in or to be a priority for us, but something that's we, money is simply a tool that we should use to serve God better. Some people, God, let me say it another way in, in, in transition. Some people in our church, God has given the gift of teaching, and they are able to teach God's word. They're, oftentimes they become our pastors or teachers in the church. And so God gives the gift of teaching. So we'll be able to teach people God's word. And that's, a, that's an important gift the church gives. But the Bible also talks about it. it gives also some other people the gift of, for instance, of leadership, and which is also necessary and important in the church to, to lead the church in the right direction. God also gives the church to some the, the gift of, of resources and the ability to make money and the ability to use money in that way. And that's also a stewardship and a gift from the lord to be used 
for his church or for his ministry. So that's not what I was talking about here with the selfish rich men, but I want to balance it off and help you understand that using this illustration of selfish rich men is not a condemnation of all rich people. So let's go back to our text in James chapter 5. And we'll see under selfish rich men, first of all, the condemnation of the selfish rich men by witnesses, by different witnesses. And the first one, uh, the, the witness calls to shame, uh, calls for shame and calls for remorse of the rich men. He says, you, you weep and you howl for your miseries that should come upon you. He's calling them to, to, uh, to be repentant. He's calling them to... Uh, to do that too before the condemnation actually comes, he says, because there is a there is a shame and remorse that comes. Think about the Luke sixteen passage where the rich man opens his eyes up in hell and torments, and the shame and the remorse that he had there for the excuse me, the life of luxury he lived and the abuse he made to Lazarus there in uh, Luke sixteen. So the condemnation of the witnesses we find there. And then the cries of the witnesses against the selfish rich man also is here in this passage. And these go, uh, so not only is he condemned, especially the selfish rich man, the unsaved rich man, not only is he condemned, in a sense, by his riches, he also has witnesses against him. That's listed here. It's, it's very interesting how, how this is brought out by the Holy Spirit. But these will be witnesses against him, not just here, but even more so. I think these are witnesses will be crying out against him all for eternity as he remembers the pleasure he has for a very short period of time compared to all the turmoil and the his selfishness and his shame and remorse he has in, in hell. So what is in the cries? What is in the witnesses? Well, the wealth. Verse 3 talks about your gold and silver is cankered. Uh, rust of them shall be a witness against you. So the rust of your gold and silver um, will wit be a witness against the selfish rich man. He's trusted in this gold and silver, and, and as he's trusted and, and valued that gold and silver for so much time, eventually what he finds out is <coughs> rusting away. It's losing its value. Like the inflation today, inflation is a big problem in our world right now, big problem in our country, big problem in your country, where the value uh, the value of money is, is a lot less than it was even a year ago. And so uh, you, 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 could buy, you could buy things for so many rupees a year ago, and now it costs much more, many more rupees than it does, than the same item does even a year ago. And so then the idea of inflation, the value goes down. Their wealth is being inflated, it's rusting away, so it cries out against them. The wages do the laborers, verse 4. The higher the laborers uh, that are reaped in your fields are, are crying out against them. The wages that are do your laborers are crying out against you as a witness saying that you're cheating us. You owe us money and not paying. And Of course, this is a big deal with these day laborers. They depend each day on being paid. That's how they buy their food, and that's how they... Um, provide for their family, and if they're not being paid, then um, then they're being uh, the word here for defrauded. They're being cheated against these selfish rich men who can pay them but do not. And the laborers themselves are calling out. And the cries of them that are reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. The laborers themselves are crying out against them. You owe us. You're not paying us. We've worked all day long, and you refuse to pay us until tomorrow, or you only pay us part of what you promised to pay us. And these witnesses are all crying out their wealth, their wages. The laborers are crying out against the selfish rich men. But the encouragement in the last part of verse 4 is that the cries, especially of the laborers, are heard by the Lord of Sabaoth. And this word Sabaoth is not the word Lord of Sabbath. It's not talking about the Lord of Sabbath. That's a different word. But the Hebrew word Sabaoth, it means the Lord of hosts or the Lord of armies, which really is bringing out the fact that the laborers are crying out to the Lord of 
the all-powerful, omnipotent God who is able to come and remove the selfish man's riches from his life. In fact, he's able to remove the selfish man from his life. Um, and so it's it's quite an awesome thought, what he's trying to say. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, the most the omnipotent, powerful God is hearing the cries of these poor, defrauded, um, and really, in a sense, weak um, because they haven't got the food, they haven't got the money to be able to buy their own food. Laborers, they are being mistreated and treated with injustice by the rich. And so the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the omnipotent God even hears and gets involved in this as the cries of the witnesses against the selfish men come forth. And then beyond the condemnation by these witnesses and the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, knowing about this and, and taking the sides of those who are being mistreated, uh, then there's the corrosion of the wealth itself. And we talked about this a little bit, but the corrosion of the wealth is also factoring in here. And this is always something rich people are concerned about because they buy things and they're concerned because those things lose value quickly. They're, their their uh, riches, it says here, are corrupted, verse 2, and their garments are moth-eaten. Uh, so the things they buy, the riches, become corrupted. I mean, they buy, they buy land, for instance, because they're rich, and then it gets contaminated by whatever, sewage, or it gets contaminated by oil or, or something that got spilt there or, some, or something that's wrong. It gets contaminated, so it loses a lot of value. Uh, they buy beautiful clothes, but over time, the, the insects and the moths eat them. They buy, verse 3, we were talking about this, gold and silver, and it begins to rust or inflation begins to eat it. And so that's the problem when you're trusting in uncertain riches. They are something that's, uh, uncertain riches are something that's temporary, uh, something that that loses its value immediately. Um, we always encourage folks especially folks early on when they're when they don't have a lot of resources not to buy a new car in America uh, that we always taught and, and statistically this is true that when you buy a new car once you drive it off the the from the dealership when you buy a new car it loses about 25 percent of its value the first day it's no longer a new car you can't sell it as a new car once you begin to drive it so it loses a lot of its value the first day. So in financial counseling, which I also do, we do a financial counseling later today to uh, some people in the church. In financial counseling, we always tell people, especially folks who do not have the cash to pay for it, who take out a loan to buy new cars, and don't do that. Shop for a good used car where the value of the new car value has already been lost, and you can buy that car for perhaps 50% or less of what it was, what it would cost the, the owner to buy it originally. Things lose value is what's saying. The corrosion of wealth, the inflation that affects it, the, the moths that eat the garments, the the, uh, the the gold and silver being eaten or rusting away, the corrosion of wealth itself. Selfish man deals with all these things, these these witnesses against him. The, the fact that the wealth is is disintegrating and going away. Luke 12 reminds us some of that. I think that's a good verse to look at as well. Jesus dealing with this aspect of the corrosion of these things. Luke 12, look how this bounces off what Jesus says. Verse 16. And he, Jesus, spake a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. But he thought with himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. He said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. So first of all, it may be, in no indication this man's a Christian anyway, just a Jewish, probably just a Jewish farmer, rich man. But he, you know, he never asks, what's the Lord's will in this matter? As we stated last time from, from uh, James 4, uh, verses 14 through 17. What's the Lord's will in this matter? If the Lord wills, I'll do this. Nope. 
This is what he will do. I will do this. This is what I will do. This will I do, verse 18 says. Verse 19, and I will, and I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine eat, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20, though, says, but God said to him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall these things be which thou hast provided? And Jesus simply made this application in verse 21. I didn't put it down verse 21. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So wealth, riches, and clothes, that's all temporary. We need to have money to buy things. We need to have clothes to wear. Uh, if God blesses us, we, we should be able to, we should invest for the future so we can plan for the future when we're no longer able to, to, uh, to work and provide for ourselves. But we cannot trust these things because they're corrosive and they disintegrate. Uh, and, and we no long, no, don't know how long we're going to live. So the corrosion of wealth also is there. Then the condition of worldliness. He also talks about this condition of worldliness uh, that, we find, that we find brought out here by the challenge of what's going on in the context. Like Luke 15. Luke 15, verse 13, which says this. Talk about the, the prodigal son chapter. And not many days after the younger son, the prodigal son, gathered all together and took us to a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want or in lack. So worldliness will lead us to waste money. Selfish rich men follow a worldly pattern oftentimes, and they spin and spin and spin and lose a lot of the money they have. Or in verse 19 of chapter 16, I alluded to this earlier, it was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he feared sumptuously every day. This is the rich man who died at the same time Lazarus died, and they both woke up in eternity. The rich man being in torments, the rat and Lazarus, not because he was poor, but because he had put his faith in Jehovah, the Lazarus wakes up um, in paradise. And what a contrast it was there. But the world, the man, the rich man enjoyed the worldliness of, uh, of his riches. He lived very sumptuously, it says here. We'll go back to James 5 again. We move on. I have to look at the selfish rich man. Now we contrast that with the one the selfish rich men mistreated. That's the poor laborers. The poor laborers. They've been introduced to us as well. We see them introduced in verse four and following these day laborers who who uh, who are being defrauded. Um, Day laborers is a very common thing where a person works for a day and he gets, is expecting, hoping to get paid that night by the his employer, usually a rich person, a business owner, whatever the case might be. And there's also the command, even in the Old Testament, that if someone works for you during the day, you pay them at night. You don't make them wait till the next day. Why? Because day laborers use the money they earn each day to pay their bills, to buy their food and so forth. They need that that evening well this these rich men were not doing that and that's why the laborers were calling out to the lord of sabaoth they were despondent also verse six says they were condemned and they you know, killed the just um even christians they were the christians who, many of these christians were with these poor laborers they were day laborers and they worked each day and they worked hard each day and expect to be paid but instead of being paid, oftentimes they were being uh, not paid. And so it was, they, they were going hungry and not having food to pay their, to provide for their family. And so they were being hungry and condemned. And, and they were, some were, apparently some were even dying of starvation or their children were. And this was wrong. They were being treated unjustly, and treated with injustice, as James was saying here. 
So the poor laborers were experiencing that. There was, there was nothing they could do about it, really. They were in a condition financially where they had to work each day to make their money. And, uh, and when they weren't getting paid each day for their work, they were dying or they were suffering greatly. Um, so this is what the illustration was he's trying to bring out to let us understand this. Um, being treated unjustly. And so here, let's say the poor laborers, many of them were Christians. They were going through this. And so they're being treated unjustly. So here are some instructions then that we're given as believers. If we find ourselves in a similar situation, whether it's employer, employee like this, or maybe it's by the government, maybe it's by um, by other uh, by other religious leaders and, and, and so forth. We're going to be treated unjustly with injustice by, by many. And so here are some instructions that we're given verses 7 through 11. Which reads, be patient, therefore, brethren. So he's known as that brethren. So he's talking to the believers. The unbelievers cannot do this. This is not really possible for them to do on a consistent basis. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job, have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So here are some instructions he gives us as we are being treated uh, with injustice in whatever our context might be. He exhorts us first, be patient, be patient. Verse 7, verse 8, be patient. His theme continues over patience, continues throughout this passage, but be patient. This is a different word we only find in verse um Verse, uh, it's gonna be chapter one, like in verses three and four, talking about this idea of enduring under, holding under. This is a different Greek word. It'd be good to do a word study on this, and you could preach the differences of the two Greek words. Uh, but this idea of long tempered, long suffering, and why can you be long tempered as you're being mistreated? Because you know God's gonna make all things right, God's gonna come and, and do what's right. Eventually, the unsaved rich men will be judged for their for their in, in being acting unjustly, and eventually, the believers like Lazarus will be freed and will be uh, in heaven. And will be out of torments. Remember, going back to that Matthew, um, I mean, it's gonna be Luke sixteen passage of scripture. Uh, he will be out of his torments eventually, in his problems. So we're told to be patient. And the, and the motivation being the fact that the Lord's returning. The Lord will come, and he will come and make things all right. He will come and take us who are saved back to heaven and give us, uh, you know, give us our, eventually our new bodies, um, a body that will no longer hunger, a body that no longer has to be a day laborer, a body that, that no longer has to go under the effects of being uh, condemned and dying. So the Lord's return is coming soon, and as Titus calls it there in Titus 2, that's our blessed hope. What a blessed hope that is. So be patient. The Lord's coming soon, and when he comes, he not only will take care of you, he will also judge the rich, selfish, rich, uh, the selfish rich men. Then he gives us three examples of how we can be patient, how we can be long-suffering, And why we should be examples we can look at three examples of being long suffering and waiting. And we re we read about that. Knowing that the Lord's coming is, is will be soon. First of all, he talks about the farmer. Verse seven calls him the husbandman. That's all we would say today, the farmer, the one who tends to the garden, the one who tends to the vineyard, the husbandman. And he wa they waited for the precious fruit of the earth. 
and have long patience for it until he received the early and latter rains. He's patient for the harvest. The, the farmer, as hard as it is, and farming is hard. Many of you do farming, especially those who, who are outside the cities. Many of you do farming. You know, it takes, it takes time. It takes time preparing soil. It takes money buying the seed or or finding the right seed then there's the, the planting process the time that's involved with that making sure the soil is prepared planting the, the soil then making sure it's watered making sure that they have some kind of fertilization that goes along with that and then uh, you know eventually more watering uh, taking care and keeping the weeds away um which can sap the energy from the from the plant and then even to the point where after it begins to bear the fruit, waiting and bearing, picking the fruit instead of just letting it die on the vine. Uh, farming's hard work and his patience that he has for the harvest, long patience, waiting for that, waiting for the rains, early and latter rains. And it's just it just takes a while. It takes a while to do that. It does not happen immediately. It takes months for it to happen. And so being patient when we're being mistreated, maybe maybe mis be maybe mistreated for months, maybe for years. But eventually the Lord's still gonna come and it's gonna be a harvest in which he's gonna bless us and he's gonna judge those who have mistreated us. It's as sure as as a agricultural harvest is every year. So the Lord's harvest, his judgment is coming. So that's one example we think of. So we're told in verse 9, because of that, though you may feel like it, stop grumbling, especially against other Christians. Stop grumbling. Don't allow in-writing going on there, infighting going on. Um, grudge not one against another. That's the idea of word is the idea of grumbling and complaining, um, showing favoritism, showing, showing uh, grudging in that sense against each other. Because once again, not only is our, the judge of the rich, selfish man nearby, so is our judge nearby. And God's going to judge us for how we treat others. So if we are being mistreated by, by uh, the owner of the business or by our boss or whatever else, and then we mistreat those under us, then we're just like he is. Except we're Christians and we know better. But 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us this for the believer. This is not for the unbeliever. But the context here is for the Christian. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, But we must all appear before the judgment seat, the Bema seat of Christ. And the Bema seat, <coughs> excuse me, the Bema seat, which is what the Greek word is, they're translated judgment in the English. The Bema seat of Christ in the New Testament times for the athletic games was the place that the winners went for their rewards. So our judge, uh, the final judge, and the rewarder is there at the Bema seat, and we're being called to appear before the judgment seat that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad, or good or worthless. It's not the word um, evil, but the word worthless here is the Greek word. And so we have, we have here the fact that we also will be judged. So uh, whether we will receive reward or not. And if we're grumbling and complaining and fighting with each other, um, if we're competing with each other, if we're fussing with each other all the time, then we are losing our blessings. We're losing our reward. So the, one example is that of the farmer. This is an example of the prophets who are patient for heaven. He says, take, for example, the prophets, verse 10 says, spoken in the name of the Lord, as they have suffered affliction and of patience. And the, and the prophets, the Old Testament, even the New Testament prophets, who are great examples and role models to all of us as Christians, all of us as preachers. Many of them suffer greatly with great injustice. And a lot of them actually died, died for their faith. You have examples of that in Hebrews 11, about different ones who died for their faith and did not see, um, you know, did not see Jerusalem and did not see the church 
did not enjoy these things that we enjoy today. They were they were killed for their faith. But even Jesus said in Matthew 5, these are blessed. Blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. They're patient for heaven. And so we also to learn from the prophets who did what was right, who preached the truth, and still many of them were martyred. That God still will make things right. And the worst thing they can do to us when they treat us unjustly is kill us. But killing us as Christians is only getting us to heaven quicker. Even just getting us in the Lord's presence faster. So the farmer is a great example to us. The prophets are great examples to us of, of being patient. And so is Job. <clears throat> Job is also a great example. What's going to read in verse 11? We count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. And have seen the end of the Lord, or the, or the purpose of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So Job was patient for him, patient for God to make things right. He did not understand all was going on. He did not have the revelation that we have today. In fact, Job probably had no written scripture because he probably lived during the time of Abraham. So there was no written scripture at that time. But he had uh, he had a knowledge of God, knowledge of God's ways, and he trusted God to make all things right, despite terrible, terrible um, trials he went through, though allowed by God, still mistreated by the devil, mistreated by foreign countries, uh, foreign nations that, that stole from him. And, and <clears throat> excuse me, this is going on. Job was patient for God to make things right. And eventually, as we know, because we have the, the 42 chapters of the book of Job, God was glorified and Job was purified through these trials. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, just like Job, we can, we can find grace. Good grace that is sufficient for us in our time of need, or as Hebrews 4 says, grace that we need in time of need. We can find that kind of grace, even as Job did, as we go through the trials and troubles of our lives. So those are the instructions for the believers uh, is not to fight back, not to uh, not to make life miserable for those who treat us unjustly, but ultimately to, to trust in the Lord that he is going to make things right, that he will provide for us and bless us, and he will judge them, uh, judge them that are, have mistreated us. And so our reaction when we're treated with injustice is to patiently, Wait on the Lord. Have a sweet Christian testimony. Show the difference Christ has made. Be patient for the harvest, patient for heaven, and patient for God to make all things right. And until he does, as Job found out, God's grace is sufficient for us. All right. We're going to take our break now. Um, Ten-minute break, so we'll come back a little after 6, about 6.02, 6.03, your time, uh, 6.04, your time now, I guess it says, and we'll take our quiz. And part of the quiz is writing from memory, James 4, uh, James chapter 4, verse 17. So if you have forgotten about that or need to review, this is the time to do so. So we'll come back in 6.04 p.m., your time, and we will take our quiz.